Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed. A couple of days ago, we checked out the Cooler Master Tempest GP27U, the first monitor to bring a decent 4K HDR gaming experience to buyers at a price tag below $1,000 US. Well, today we're looking at its very similar brother, the GP27Q, which swaps out the 4K capable hardware for a 1440p panel instead. Combined with a lower price tag, this could be the perfect entry point to HDR gaming for PC enthusiasts. The GP27Q really is very similar to the GP27U in a lot of ways, most notably the use of a 576 zone mini LED full array local dimming backlight bringing true HDR hardware and over a thousand nits of peak brightness. This is combined with a 27 inch 1440p IPS LCD panel capable of up to a 165Hz refresh rate with standard adaptive sync features. It's enhanced with quantum dots and 98% DCI-P3 coverage, so a decent set of hardware here similar to other high-end 1440p displays. With the drop from 4K in the GP27U to 1440p in the GP27Q, we also get a reduction in price. The 1440p variant is $300 cheaper and has been sold for as low as $500 US up until a few days ago when it went out of stock. The links in the description will have up-to-date pricing and stock levels, but that's quite a compelling price for an HDR monitor. I don't think we've ever seen full array local dimming hit such a low price tag. If you watched all of my GP27U review, several sections in this review will be quite familiar to you as the GP27Q is pretty much identical in a few areas. If you do watch all of our videos, I really appreciate that, but there will be a few repeated segments here, so bear with me. If this is your first time watching the channel, welcome, and let's get to the review. The GP27Q uses an effectively identical design to the GP27U. There are a few very minor differences, but for the most part, the two models are identical. Cooler Master really aren't trying anything fancy here. The stand is constructed from a nice metal, and the base appears to be shaped like the Cooler Master logo. Size-wise, it's pretty similar to other square type bases we've seen from other monitors, but I guess it's more like a ring with a circular pillar. The front of the display is very basic and lets the display panel do the talking. With typical bezels on all sides and a matte anti-glare coating you'll be familiar with if you've used other desktop LCD monitors. I'm not a big fan of the rear of this monitor and the overall construction doesn't seem all that premium with mostly basic black plastic, a few seams and basic RGB LED elements. I think this is more suited to a $500 product like this than the GP27U, but even in this product class it's not the greatest design I've seen. It's not a big deal though as you'll rarely see the back of the monitor and I'd rather see compromises in design than display hardware. The stand has the full range of ergonomic adjustments, including height, tilt, swivel, and pivot, and it's quite a stable design as well, which is good to see. The range of height adjust is only okay, though it does support razor mounting. As for ports, Cooler Master includes one DisplayPort 1.4 and two HDMI 2.0 ports, plus USB Type-C that also does DP alt mode and 90 watts of power delivery. That's a good range of connectivity, however the HDMI ports are limited to just 144Hz rather than the full 165Hz, which would have been enabled if HDMI 2.1 was used instead. As for the on-screen display, it's controlled through a directional toggle on the rear. Cooler Master's OSD is a familiar design to several other brands I've seen and includes typical set of features by modern standards. We do see a range of color controls and various modes, plus settings for local dimming and so on. The game features include crosshairs, FPS counters, timers, there's a shadow boosting mode and a blue light filter, so all the usual things that we see from other display vendors. There's also a KVM switch, but from some brief testing it seems a bit buggy to use relative to other KVM setups. For response time performance, the GP27Q performs very similarly to the GP27U, which is a good thing, although there are some small differences. One is the maximum refresh rate. The GP27Q goes up to 165Hz compared to 160Hz, and this refresh rate is supported in the adaptive sync mode. The off overdrive setting performs reasonably well for a setting with no overdrive, but as usual, gamers will typically prefer to use a setting that improves performance. The normal mode delivers us a solid 5.73 millisecond response time average with good refresh compliance that's suitable for 165Hz gaming. Cumulative deviation is good and overshoot is negligible, but for gaming at the higher end of this refresh range, it's the advanced mode that will be the most tempting. Here the monitor does 4.26 milliseconds, and while that is accompanied by a small increase to overshoot, in practice inverse ghosting really isn't visible using this setting. 
Cumulative deviation is also improved compared to the normal mode, indicating that this is the best mode to use at 165Hz. Then we have the ultra fast mode, which is unusable due to its high level of overshoot. For variable refresh rate gaming, the advanced mode is good for high refresh rates at or above 120Hz, but when we start getting to lower refresh rates, overshoot creeps in, which can be noticeable as minor inverse ghosting artifacts. It's not a big deal in this mode, but at 85 and 60Hz, we see inverse ghosting rates above 30%, which is noticeable noticeable in practice. So while I would choose advanced for high refresh rates, it's not optimal for general adaptive sync users, especially if you have a mid-range GPU. The normal mode is great across the entire refresh rate range though. While not as fast as the advanced mode for the top refreshes, we still get very good refresh compliance and much lower overshoot than advanced across the board. This makes lower refreshes like 85 and 60 Hz much more usable with minimal artifacts. So this is the mode that I'd choose for adaptive sync gamers, and I believe with this mode we do get a single overdrive mode experience, even though variable overdrive is not used. Yes, variable overdrive likely would have improved performance, but I'm satisfied with these results. Speaking of variable overdrive, Cooler Master do provide a dynamic mode, however during testing this just enabled the advanced mode at all refresh rates when used in conjunction with adaptive sync. TFT Central discovered the dynamic mode does adjust overdrive when used at fixed refresh rates, but this isn't particularly useful for those gaming with VRR enabled, which would be most PC gamers. I'd recommend just sticking to the normal mode. There's also a user configurable overdrive setting which can deliver minor optimizations compared to the built-in modes, but during my testing I wasn't able to give a notable boost to performance relative to normal or advanced. This will be more useful for people in very hot or very cold operating environments where the built-in modes won't deliver optimal performance. Compared to other monitors, the GP27Q delivers essentially the same response time experience at the maximum refresh rate as the GP27U. Overdrive tweaking seems identical between the two models. This makes the GP27Q quite fast and among the better 1440p monitors I've tested. It's not quite as good as the PG279QM, but it outperforms more entry-level options like the Gigabyte M27QP and offers a better experience than MSI's popular MAG274QRF-QD. Average performance across the refresh range is more mid-table. The GP27Q has impressively low overshoot for a response time average of just 5 milliseconds, and realistically the monitors above it in the chart have achieved higher speeds by cranking up the overdrive, thereby also increasing overshoot. The exceptions to this are products like the Samsung Odyssey G7 with its fast and well-tuned VA panel, and of course OLEDs which are in an entirely different price category. It's not a surprise to see the GP27Q match the GP27U in cumulative deviation. As I said, these displays both appear to be identically tuned at the factory. What this means is we get quite solid performance from an IPS that's in line with other modern LCDs. The GP27Q is as fast as great monitors like the 27GP850 from LG and the MAG274QRF-QD from MSI, and it gets quite close to the Odyssey Neo G7. There are only a handful of faster 1440p monitors that I've tested, chiefly the ASUS PG279QM and PG27AQN, which are more expensive and use G-Sync variable overdrive. At a fixed 120Hz, the GP27Q performs well, offering a 5 millisecond experience with minimal overshoot. The vast majority of current generation IPS monitors deliver between 4.5 and 5.5 milliseconds in this benchmark, which is a negligible difference either way, and the GP27Q is in the middle of that. 60Hz performance is very solid though, we're getting a faster than average 5.2 millisecond experience with low overshoot, which makes the monitor great for gaming at lower refresh rates. One interesting difference I spotted between the GP27Q and GP27U was input latency. The 4K model had around 3.5 milliseconds of processing delay when tested at its maximum 160Hz refresh rate, but the 1440p variant cuts that to a more normal 0.6 milliseconds. This could be because I tested the 165Hz refresh here with adaptive sync enabled, whereas this isn't possible on the GP27U. Or maybe it just has naturally lower input lag, but this is good news for SDR gaming. Input lag in the HDR mode though is a lot higher and similar to the 4K model with around 14 milliseconds of processing delay. This is due to the processing required to run the local dimming algorithms, which significantly increase latency. While it's typical for HDR monitors to have more lag in the HDR mode, the GP27Q is slower than usual, although whether this is an issue will come down to whether you are a seriously competitive gamer or not.
Power consumption is decent with the 1440p model using less power than the 4K model, both calibrated to 200 nits. It's still a somewhat higher than average result for a 1440p display, but nothing outrageous. This sort of result is manageable, and the monitor rarely exceeds 100 watts in its HDR mode, showing bright content. Interestingly, the GP27Q does support backlight strobing, which wasn't available on the GP27U. The relevant setting here is called MPRT, and it has three settings which control the strobe length and brightness. The clearest of these is the high setting, which looks okay at 165Hz, though there is a bit of strobe crosstalk and a noticeable second image. This is more pronounced at the top and bottom of the display, and unfortunately there is no ability to adjust strobe timing to optimize this. There are several other limitations to strobing, for example you can't use it in conjunction with adaptive sync, and the minimum strobed refresh rate is 120Hz. This limits its usability, although some people may find a use for it at a fixed refresh rate with a frame cap or something like that. Color performance is up next, and the GP27Q happens to be an extremely wide gamut monitor. We're not only getting 98.3% DCI-P3 coverage, which is one of the widest results I've recorded, but 99% Adobe RGB coverage as well, giving us great coverage of two popular wide color spaces. In total, we get 86% Rec 2020 coverage, which so far is the highest recorded coverage I've tested in a gaming monitor. The Quantum Dots here are doing great work to enhance the color space. Out-of-the-box accuracy is interesting. Grayscale performance is good, although not as good as the GP27U. Grayscale performance is decent, although a few small issues with CTT and Gamma lead to a Delta E ITP average of 6.04, which is only slightly above average. This display does ship with its wide gamut fully unlocked by default, so there is significant oversaturation when viewing regular SDR content in the SDR mode. This display has such a wide color gamut that some areas are obviously oversaturated, such as common skin tones, which typically appear redder than usual on this display. High delta E's in the saturation and color checker tests are not a surprise. Compared to other displays, factory grayscale performance is good, but more of a mid-table result, and color checker performance is quite weak due to its wide gamut mode being used by default. The GP27Q includes several display modes for other color gamuts, including sRGB, DCI-P3, and Adobe RGB. I'm going to focus on the sRGB mode here, but the other modes have similar results relative to their color gamuts. In the sRGB mode, there is an improvement to grayscale performance with the closer adherence to the correct gamma and also CCT performance, leading to great delta E's. As for the gamut clamping ability, the sRGB mode is okay, but the clamp reduces gamut coverage in the reds too aggressively, which is also the case for the P3 and Adobe RGB modes. This limits total color space to 91% sRGB, which is mediocre. The accuracy of this mode is otherwise acceptable, though again it's disappointing some areas to color control such as white balance are disabled when the sRGB mode is used. For a proper calibrated experience that delivers the full sRGB gamut, a software calibration is required and we used CalMan for this. Doing this provided the best experience in color managed apps as a single profile can access all of the sRGB P3 and Adobe RGB capabilities, plus the calibrated results are generally pretty good here. You're not going to be able to achieve excellent hardware calibrated results, but for color accurate work this monitor's extremely wide gamut provides a lot of versatility for those that need multiple color gamuts. I should also mention here that using local dimming in the SDR mode leads to bad color performance, and I wouldn't recommend doing this. Cooler Master does not enable dimming in the SDR mode by default, and we tested with dimming disabled. There are gamma issues when using this combination that appears to blow out the display. Generally, I don't recommend dimming for SDR anyway, as flaws with local dimming are more noticeable in desktop apps with high contrast edges than they are playing games or watching videos in the HDR mode. Maximum brightness in the SDR mode was very good, exceeding the 4K model by offering 640 nits, really far too much brightness for most typical usage conditions. Minimum brightness is okay at 51 nits, so this 1440p variant actually has a greater total brightness range than the 4K model in both directions. Native contrast from this panel was pretty mediocre though, only coming in at 991 to 1 after calibration, which isn't Unusual from an IPS, but it's hardly an amazing result compared to OLED and VA alternatives. If you're using the monitor with local dimming disabled, as we recommend in the SDR mode, or you're viewing content where local dimming is ineffective, you can expect a fairly low contrast ratio.
Viewing angles are good, but don't expect anything outrageous. This is your typical IPS viewing experience, which these days tends to provide great viewing angles. Uniformity was average. The top half of my unit had a slightly warmer tone than the bottom half, which is shown perhaps to a bit of an exaggerated degree by this uniformity chart. Not a massive deal breaker, but something I could notice when looking closely. I also saw a bit of IPS glow on my unit, though like uniformity, this can vary between units. Moving now to HDR performance, and this is obviously a huge selling point of the GP27Q. The good news is that the hardware provided here is genuinely capable of true HDR and offers all three pillars of HDR to an acceptable level. Brightness exceeds 1000 nits, color space is strong thanks to well over 80% Rec 2020 coverage, and contrast is enhanced due to the 576 zone full array local dimming mini LED backlight. The zones here are arranged into a 32 by 18 grid, with each zone responsible for roughly 6400 pixels. A modest zone count, but it is effective for HDR. By far the biggest issue with the GP27Q is the firmware problems using it in the HDR mode. The same issues as with the GP27U as of when we made this review. Enabling HDR in the first place is quite janky, the monitor needs to be in the auto mode for HDR to work properly but leaving it in this mode for SDR causes issues, so it's not so much of an auto mode but an on mode. This makes it difficult to easily switch between HDR and SDR modes while preserving great image quality. Secondly, you cannot use HDR and adaptive sync at the same time. This is a deal breaker for the monitor and it's baffling how it was shipped in this condition given how vital variable refresh rates are to the PC gaming experience. Any attempt to enable VRR and HDR at the same time will disable one or the other feature, so to use HDR you have to accept that VRR won't work, at least in the current firmware. Cooler Master told me that a firmware update enabling HDR and VRR at the same time will be provided this month, however as the monitor is currently available and shipping to users in this condition, we opted to review it using the current firmware. We prefer not to review products based on the promises of the manufacturer, rather what it can do right now, especially if the product is in the hands of buyers already. Putting aside the firmware problems for now, how does the GP27Q look in its HDR mode? Pretty good thanks to its FALD backlight. We're getting a strong combination of high peak brightness and dimming ability that makes most HDR content look great. This is a clear step up over fake HDR monitors and semi-HDR products with edge lit dimming. It's really a night and day comparison. 576 zones is far superior for HDR than pathetic 16 or 32 zone configurations. It's more than an order of magnitude tighter dimming than those products. As this is one of the only 1440p HDR monitors on the market, there aren't a lot of super relevant comparison points, especially as the majority of other HDR monitors are far more expensive, especially if you want to go OLED. But really this display is quite competitive with more expensive HDR products in the overall HDR presentation. It looks clearly better than the Sony InZone M9 and also provides superior dimming ability to last gen products like the Acer Predator X27 which had 384 zones. As for a comparison to higher end options like the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 or OLEDs, the GP27Q has a more basic HDR experience, more entry level as you'd expect from a display that's half the price. The Neo G7 is over a thousand dimming zones and OLEDs have per pixel dimming, so 576 zone monitors like this just can't deliver the same level of dimming ability as those products, and the Neo G7 with its VA panel also helps increase contrast in difficult situations. In a practical sense, the GP27Q is pretty similar to these higher end monitors when HDR content is brighter or doesn't have especially small bright objects on screen. In many situations that I tested, I'd say the GP27Q has a really good HDR presentation with good contrast. It's when scenes get more difficult that the GP27Q's more limited zone count can be exposed. Large areas of dark shadow detail right next to bright objects can reveal some blooming into the dark areas, which is a lot less noticeable on the highest end HDR products. Subtitles and letterboxing can cause issues here too, depending on the content. Then we also see problems with star fields and Christmas lights, which look better on the Neo G7, but only really shine on OLEDs. Really any scenes that include small bright elements, smaller than the zone size, aren't optimal on this sort of HDR monitor. During my time using the GP27Q I did notice blooming at times, so I'd expect similar if you end up buying one, but I don't think that should take away from what is otherwise a good value HDR experience. This monitor gives a substantial upgrade over SDR and does give you the true benefit of HDR, just not all of the time like you might see from a higher end product.
Let's put some numbers to this discussion. Firstly, we need to assess which HDR mode is the best, given there are three local dimming settings. These three settings adjust the peak brightness on offer and slightly tweak EOTF tracking, with the high setting offering the highest brightness. I found the medium setting to offer the best experience. It only drops peak brightness by a few hundred nits compared to high, still well over a thousand nits, but more closely follows the EOTF curve in the mid to upper range. The low local dimming mode is dimmer not just for peak brightness, but also most of the upper EOTF range. The medium mode is what we'll be using for testing, and here's a look at how the monitor fares for dark content, pretty similar to using the high mode here. What was interesting to discover is the GP27Q has less ability to control the backlight for dark levels than the GP27U, causing a more stair-stepped result for dark measurements. This isn't a big deal in practice, just an interesting observation compared to the more premium 4K option. What's more of a big deal was terrible HDR white balance accuracy on the Q model versus what I previously measured on the U model. All available HDR modes on the GP27Q are far too cool, causing a significant blue tint relative to an accurate product. This leads to poor delta E's in all results, and it's annoying that white balance is not adjustable in the HDR mode, otherwise this would be easily fixable. I noticed this tint straight away, and the cold tone in the HDR mode does impact content in a negative way. Full screen sustained brightness is excellent with the GP27Q capable of over 1000 nits which is better than most other HDR monitors I've tested and significantly superior to OLEDs. This level of brightness is held for peak flashes, in fact there is no significant difference between peak and sustained brightness for this display. 10% window brightness is also strong around 1300 nits, a little lower than the U model but still a great result. For all window sizes, we get over 900 nits from this monitor, which is very strong levels of brightness. No issues here. For best case single frame contrast, the GP27Q provides a good result, though not as good as the best HDR monitors. With the result of about 160,000 to 1, this exceeds our minimum requirement for a true HDR product. When any part of the screen is illuminated, all zones are active, but at a very low luminance level to show black. So this prevents an essentially infinite contrast ratio in this test, but nevertheless, it's a good result. In worst case tests, the GP27Q doesn't fare as well. When dark and bright objects are close together, the GP27Q's moderate zone size leads to only a 3x improvement in contrast compared to native. The PG32UQX with twice the number of zones gets about a 5x improvement, while the Neo G7 is a great monitor thanks to its combination of 1196 FALD zones and VA tech. While this is only a mid-table result, the GP27Q has clearly better dimming abilities than any of the fake HDR products that sit below it, and even beats out some of the basic HDR monitors out there, such as the Predator X27. In the checkerboard test again, the GP27Q sits about in the middle of the table, providing around a 2x increase on native contrast, with the GP27U performing a bit better, but not substantially so. I think the low result compared to the best HDR monitors is indicative of how you're more likely to see blooming on the GP27Q than the best HDR products. Does the Neo G7 look over 7 times better for HDR content? That's rarely the case, but in tricky scenarios, that monitor does indeed produce better visuals. Final section of this review is the Hub Essentials checklist, which looks to see if Cooler Master are advertising this monitor correctly and whether they are meeting basic performance standards. In the first two sections, Cooler Master do pretty well, though supporting HDMI 2.1 and reducing sRGB mode limitations would be welcome. The performance section is problematic. The GP27Q is advertised as a 1 millisecond monitor, and while it's fast, 1 millisecond is not achievable using practical settings. At best, this is a 2 millisecond display. Variable refresh is not supported in the HDR mode as well, which is an issue. However, the HDR section is great, as this is a true HDR product. The final segment covers issues and defects. While there are no apparent hardware problems like weird sub-pixel arrays or pixel inversion, there were a few too many firmware bugs, issues and limitations for my liking, so I've labelled this monitor as having moderate firmware problems. It's usable, but some of the things you'd expect to work together, like HDR and VRR, are not accessible. The Cooler Master Tempest GP27Q is an interesting monitor, and ultimately, it's very similar to the GP27U we looked at earlier, with the 4K resolution panel swapped out and replaced with the 1440p unit instead. Many areas of performance are close to identical between these monitors, but unfortunately, some of the limitations and issues are shared as well. So, can I recommend that you buy it? Right now, the answer is comfortably no, the exact same answer I gave for the GP27U.
That's because the GP27Q doesn't allow you to use the HDR mode and adaptive sync simultaneously, which is a deal breaker for a modern PC gaming monitor. While the GP27Q is a cheaper product than the GP27U, ultimately it's still a premium 1440p display, and for its price tag I wouldn't want to accept compromises like this. General firmware jankiness is also present to the point where I feel this display is more of a beta release than a final product that is shipping to paying customers right now. Cooler Master do say they are working on a firmware update to allow HDR and VRR to work together, but to be honest this firmware should have been available before the monitor shipped to customers. It's a huge oversight and I wasn't exactly relieved to hear that the HDR and VRR combination was disabled to minimize flickering. There's still a lot of question marks there and I'd advise buyers not to purchase this monitor until we can confirm the firmware update works as intended. If you're watching this video several weeks after we publish it, check the description and comments for any further updates. If Cooler Master were able to address this fundamental flaw and deliver an HDR plus variable refresh experience that didn't introduce other issues, the GP27Q would easily be worth purchasing. Getting this level of HDR performance, true HDR performance, at a price tag of just $500 US is simply unheard of in the current monitor market. Earlier this year, getting any sort of proper HDR hardware would have set you back over $1,000, but with the introduction of a decent 1440p model like the GP27Q, that price barrier has been slashed. 576 zones of full array local dimming provides a significant step up over an SDR experience or horrible edge lit dimming, and in conjunction with dazzling brightness, the GP27Q is capable of both decent shadow detail and very bright highlights in HDR content. It doesn't have the same excellent tight dimming as some premium HDR displays, but this HDR experience is definitely worth paying extra for compared to a basic SDR gaming monitor. Response times are also decent, leading to great motion clarity for a 165Hz monitor, although HDR input latency is rather high. Color quality hasn't been left behind either, as the GP27Q offers a huge 86% Rec 2020 color gamut and reasonable factory calibration in the SDR mode and depending on the mode you use. This makes the display quite versatile for gaming, content consumption and productivity, though I'd advise against using local dimming with the SDR mode and there were a few issues with accuracy in the HDR mode. $500 is a great price for what Cooler Master are offering, slotting right into the current day 1440p market with a premium but not outrageous price. You're looking at about $200 extra to upgrade from 1440p 165Hz to 1440p 165Hz with HDR, which feels like an acceptable deal given this is a real HDR experience. It is more expensive than the latest 1440p 240Hz panels, but cheaper than some of the flagship 1440p products we've seen over the last few years, like the Samsung Odyssey G7 and Asus PT279QM and neither of those offered good HDR. The only remaining question mark is whether Cooler Master can fix the issues with the firmware update without introducing more issues, so we'll have to see how that goes in the coming weeks. They also might have a challenge keeping it in stock if that firmware update goes well, as the hardware combination here is quite enticing. Anyway, that's it for this review. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the Monitors Unboxed channel. We just passed 50,000 subscribers. Thanks everyone that's been supporting our new channel over here. If you also want to support our independent testing, links in the description below to our Patreon and Floatplane accounts. There you'll gain access to things like the ICC profiles we generate, our monthly live streams, our Discord community, which is a great place to hang out and chat about monitors. So thanks everyone for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.